This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 451, recorded on July 21st, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. I didn't check the weather yet. Let's see. It's, I I can tell from looking out the window, it's kind of hazy, but sunny. And I know the temperature is supposed to be hot. I just haven't been outside. It is I can tell you Baltimore and Chicago, and now it's not. <laughs> 87. 87, mostly sunny. 87 uh, Fahrenheit, which is going to be higher than 28 Celsius. Which Do you use the Apple uh, weather app, the one that comes with the phone? Um, or do you use your computer? Yeah, I use uh, several different ones. <laughs> so, yeah. I use the Apple one and, uh, you know, has animated clouds floating by. Yeah. It's 34 Celsius, partly cloudy. It's been a hot week. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's see where it Here is. My dashboard says it's cooler. It says it's 83, which then translates to 28 Celsius. So somewhere in that range. Actually, when I check four apps at once, the temperatures, <laughs> one of them is usually the average, but it's not always the same one. <laughs> we're, we're hotter here. We're 34. That's a yeah. lot hotter here. Also joining us from... South Bend, Indiana. Rich Condit. <laughs> <laughs> no, just Bend. I am, I am not in Indiana. And, he, and he's not in Bend, really. He's outside of Bend. Wait, South I'm River? In, Forked River? What is it? Uh, it, it? Sun River. Sun River, Idaho. Uh, Oregon. No, Oregon. There you go. We got it. Sun River, Oregon, where the temperature <laughs> is a delightful 68 degrees. That's um, actually 69 degrees. That's uh, 21C. Uh, sunny skies, 30% humidity. The climate here in the summer, I must specify, is delightful. In the winter, it's fun to play in for a limited period of time. But um, the summer, it's absolutely delightful. I'm looking here at the weather in my home in Austin. And it is right now 98 on its way to 100. And we're looking at 15 days of temperatures uh, between 100 and 105. So this is a good time to be in Oregon. Yeah. Uh, what's what's the name of the place again? Tell me. Sun River. You're going to put it in the show notes? Yeah, I, I can't remember. I don't know why. I can remember every virus on the planet, but I can't remember Sun well, River. Well, it's because I move around a lot. No, no. We, we, you've I mean, been I, I, could, for, I, I could be in Indiana, for all you know. You've been there for a few weeks, so I should remember I've been it, there, but, yes. Uh, I've been gone for a month. Or well, you know, they say when you write things down, that's how you remember it. And I've never yeah, well, it down. different strokes for different folks. Teaching it, that's what really locks it in for me, which is... Yeah, that, that'll do it. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it is, um, well, today it's nice, and tomorrow it's supposed to be nice, and then we're supposed to get another slug of rain moving through. But right now it's 87 Fahrenheit, which is 31C, Kathy. Um, and uh, I only know that because it's right in front of me on the, the <laughs> NOAA weather site. Uh, humidity is 48%, so it's it's less muggy than it was yesterday. Quite nice. So it's been very hot here in the city all week, and you know I drive in. I usually have my air on, but there's always a big backup at the George Washington Bridge, at least 20, yes. 30 minutes, and I turn my AC off because I'm just nervous. My car has 200,000 miles on it. I'm afraid <laughs> it's going to kill it. <laughs> Ooh, so, this, is a beam, this is a Beamer, right? Yeah. It's gonna, what it's, model? It's a 2007 328XI, and I've broken down on the bridge before, <gasps> which is oh. really not fun in traffic, and so I don't want to do it again. I, I know it's probably not my air conditioning, but just because I'm paranoid, I'm, and I sit there sweating, and I come in totally <laughs> soaked. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had I had an experience like this while moving from Philadelphia to New York, and I was driving a, 
a U-Haul across the GWB, stuck in traffic, like 98 degrees, humid, had the AC cranked up, and the um, uh, the the overheat light mm. came on on the dash. Isn't that great? And I turned off the air conditioning and rolled down the windows, and, and the person I was riding with who was helping me move um, – said i said yeah sorry it's going to be really uncomfortable in here he said not as uncomfortable as it'll be if this truck breaks down <laughs> yeah, right <laughs> yeah it's not fun breaking down but um especially not there so i turned it off and uh it's pretty warm but it's better to do that uh i don't know if any car would be immune i, I see cars broken down all the time last Let's see, two nights ago on the way down the turnpike, there was a car burning on the left side of the road. Oh. Ooh, that's uh, it was a big SUV. The front end was, bad day. was completely on flames. It's the kind of thing where you pass it two lanes away, you can feel the heat right? <laughs> through, through the closed window of your car. The police car was sitting about 100 yards behind it because I guess it didn't want to get caught in the explosion. <laughs> oh, yeah. my gosh. Last night, there were two different accidents on the turnpike. Sun River, Oregon sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> yeah. We we ride our bikes everywhere. I may actually drive my car today. <laughs> All right, we have some follow up from uh, last week's episode. Dixon, by the way, is in Montana. He's not too far from you, Rich. Well, oh, out west everything's me. far. Well, it's, he's closer to to Rich than I am. Yeah, fishing, you, no doubt. Yeah, he went fishing. He went to Bozeman. He's going. He went to some place near there. But the I'm meeting him next weekend. I'm going out there to do a a twiv at Rocky Mountain Labs. He's going to join me, and then he's going to take me fishing one day. Cool. I don't want to fish. I just want to watch him and see what this is all about. He said, you should fish. I said, I don't want to fish. I just want to sit back and watch you. I'm going to take videos of him fishing. I'll probably drop my camera into the water. Okay, enough of the tragedy. (laughs) <laughs> we have a follow-up from Jane Flint with respect to schematic subway maps. This goes back to the 1930s in London. She says she sends a Wikipedia link to Tube Map. Great discussion with Ben Jane. And then uh, Sasha. Wait a minute. Speaking, speaking of Jane, I have a uh, a question. You know, coming. she's listening because clearly she's listening. Straight listened. out of left field. Just yeah. be careful. Okay. Okay. Straight out of left field. Is there a past tense for the word forego? Uh, let's mm. see. Well, there's a yeah. foregone conclusion. Yes, but I don't think yeah, I don't think I don't think forwent is a right. Exactly. <laughs> forwent <laughs> or foregoed? No, I, I mean I, can't, I, I was I was I was having a conversation with myself this morning, and I came up needing this word, and it wasn't there. So. Okay. You can Nothing Google it and see several answers. Past tense, oh, yeah? and past participle, foregone. Past tense, forewent, past participle, foregone. Forewent, is it? That so just sounds weird. Yeah, it does. Yeah. All right, Alan, can you take okay. the next one, please? <laughs> uh, yes. So, Sasha Trubetskoy writes, Hi, guys. Thanks for sharing my Roman subway map. I am surprised to hear that this I just came across this guy's map at random and I guess uh, he's a listener. I think the name you're looking for is Harry Beck designer of the London Underground map he was actually an electrical engineer by training and came up with the idea of representing a transit system as if it was an electrical circuit. In 1932 he published an early version of the now ubiquitous map which was immediately rejected by the London Underground's publicity department However, due to Beck's persistence, a small print run was allowed and the map was released at a few select stations. Riders loved the simple design and demanded more. The publicity department conceded and ordered 700,000 copies. Other cities would copy Beck's idea and the rest is history. Very cool. Excellent. So Sasha probably saw the link. Probably probably uh, as an incoming link. Yeah. yeah. And then went to check it out and probably listened, which is good. Yeah. Because he found our discussion. Well, welcome aboard, Sasha. Uh, uh, D- Rich Condit, can you take the next one? Johnny writes, learned scientists. A couple of months ago, I discovered Jennifer Kahn's TED Talk on CRISPR gene drives. During the conversation around 
2323 brought to mind the activity of a gene drive. At some point, when appropriate and pertinent, could the group discuss CRISPR gene drive as a tool for use in maybe vaccine production or other uses in research? Jennifer Kahn's talk was most engaging, gives a link to it. Thanks from 27C, fairly sunny, but officially partly cloudy, Boston, Johnny. Uh, Johnny's our pediatrician friend in Boston who writes out, um, writes frequently. And Vincent here links to twi uh, TWIP 100, where we talked about uh, Cas9 mediated driver in uh, gene in mosquitoes. Yeah, I would check that out, Johnny. Um, we talked about a paper where they used CRISPR Cas9 to uh, sh make sure that a gene drives through a population. You know, you release a few mosquitoes with an altered gene, and the incorporation of the Cas9 itself ensures that it will very efficiently spread in a Mendelian fashion to other mosquitoes that they mate with. So, actually, actually, it's in a non-Mendelian fashion. Right, well, because it, it in this beats paper, the odds. They, in this paper, they say Mendelian. Hmm. It's in the abstract. Because uh, I did I put a link in here because I right. you the, know the I gene have drives I've seen outlined have it set so that it um, it duplicates itself into the other chromosomes. So then all of the de um, descendants would have it, and that would be non-Mendelian. Right, right. Uh, there's a I put in a wiki link here on gene drives that uh, describes that, and I think even has a yes, it has a cartoon that uh, helps out with that. So you put in the, you know, the guide sequence containing the mutation you want, but you incorporate also the machinery that does it so that that gets uh, incorporated into the genome along with the uh, mutagenic sequences that you want. And it winds up uh, getting not only on both chromosomes in the thing or that you originally uh, organism you originally put it in, but in particular, if it, it'll ultimately get in the germline uh, and spread that to the offspring, and it it spreads like wildfire in a few generations. Uh, it's spread throughout a, a population, which uh, this talk, the YouTube talk, goes into the pros and cons of that. Its therapeutic value and the sort of scariness of right uh, potentially. Uh, essentially infecting a population with a uh, a, a mutation. Uh, yeah, a do change. we really want to push this button? Yeah, right. So, so it's very interesting. The paper we discussed on that TWIP episode is called Highly Efficient Cas9-Mediated Gene Drive for Population Modification of the Malaria Vector Mosquito Anopheles stevensi. And this quote from the abstract, uh, such mute... Um, the... Um, blah, 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 produce progeny with a high frequency of mutations in the targeted genome sequence resulting in near Mendelian inheritance ratios of the transgene. Hmm. So it's not even Mendelian, it's near Mendelian. So it could be near on either side, I guess. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> well, and in fact, uh, Jennifer Kahn in her YouTube talk uh, uses the mosquito example, because this is where this is often touted, yeah, engineer yeah. mosquitoes to be resistant to right. uh, malaria, and talks about an experiment where the inheritance, uh, the experiment is structured so that the inheritance is uh, in a non-Mendelian fashion. And I've been uh, thinking about this because, you know, I mean, the gene drive by itself is, well, as I say, is either happy or scary, depending on your uh, perspective. But I was also thinking this morning that efforts in the past to uh, uh, engineer populations to, uh, uh, re well, for biological control, put it that way, have gone wrong. I can imagine that mosquitoes engineered to be resistant to malaria, malaria is going to find a way around this. Okay. And you're going to have the same problem all over again. I don't know. Uh, Kathy, may you take the next one, please? Sure. Shally writes, Dear Twivumvirate, humid and warm in New Hampshire, 26 degrees C, 78 Fahrenheit. Thank you so much for Twiv 449 and 450 about RNAi. I am hard-pressed to keep up with all these newfangled RNAs. Dr. Tanuver talks fast, but his parenthetical explanations were excellent. At one point, I wanted one of Rich Condit's interruptions to slow down and recap, but I guess he was away. I wasn't. I, I wasn't away. I was. I was 
uh, glued to this and trying to keep up. Ben is uh, extraordinarily articulate. I can't believe how, as he said, uh, how rapidly such coherent stuff comes out of him. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He might be one to listen to at half X speed instead of one X. Uh, yeah. I also wanted to thank Professor Young for the letter about predatory publishing. I received an invitation to write a book chapter this summer, and I considered paying the page costs out of my faculty development funds or my pocket because it was about past research that is no longer grant funded. One of the editors listed was someone I knew and respected, and Wisconsin Madison's icon was on their webpage. Fortunately, I Googled the book series before I accepted the invitation or started writing. I found a blogger that had blogged about it being a bit of a scam. But I still wasn't sure that I made the correct choice. Even if it was a minimal impact publication, I figured my promotion committee might not care. So it was a great service for Professor Young to write. There's a list of predatory publishers, no longer quite current, but amazingly extensive. And Charlie gives the list to Beale's list. Thank you again for serving so many different constituencies from undergrads up to older scientists trying to keep up, keep up with new findings. Shelley is a male, for what it's worth, and is an associate professor of chemistry at Franklin Pierce University. Hmm. We have some emails about predatory publishing later, I believe. Yeah. We might or might not get to another arc. Yes. Jess writes, hi, yet with team... Uh, it's a balmy 26C with 83% humidity, 16 kilometer per hour winds at 7 p.m. in Rhode Island. Just wanted to express how excited I was to hear from Ben Tenuver in episode 450. Well, I have meant to read more of his publications and listen to past TWIV appearance one, I will admit I was only first introduced to his work via his ABSA International Conference presentation last year in Grapevine, Texas. His talk was one that I remember distinctly because it instilled so much excitement and curiosity in me regarding engineering suicidal viruses in the lab. On several occasions, I scanned the audience to possibly connect with another soul who was as wowed as I was by the research so that we could silently agree that his work was so cool. Alas, I did not find my nerdy soul sister or brother in the moment, but it did not take away from the experience." No matter how much I learn about molecular biology, genetic engineering, virology, etc., I'm constantly impressed by what we know and by what we don't know. It's also nice to have my worlds collide between Dr. Tenuver as a TWIV fan and guest and as a participant at the ABSA conference where biosafety experts from around the world gather annually. Speaking of the ABSA conference, the year before I met Dr. Ian Crozier, who is an MD and Ebola survivor who gave an amazing and compassionate presentation regarding the West African outbreak and the subsequent medical community volunteer response. He's a phenomenal speaker and would probably be a, a great guest for the show someday if you could get him. Ooh, in, what a good idea. In any event, kudos, as always, for presenting really cool science. Take care, Jess, if we could get him. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? It's hard to get certain people. All right, I found a bit of news which I wanted to just mention. Um, probably should have made this my pick, but I didn't. <laughs> and uh, as everyone knows, uh, Google is part of a bigger company called Alphabet. And one of the other uh, companies below Alphabet is a company called Verily, which is basically the life sciences division. Yeah, just to be clear, Google restructured um, a little while ago to make sure that they weren't paying too much tax. <laughs> So besides Google and Verily, what else is there? Do we know? There, I, well, we don't necessarily know all of them, but they've they basically separated out the stuff that they can count as uh, as research mm. into other companies and Google as their commercial arm. I think. Anyway, Verily does life sciences research. I didn't realize there was a Verily, and I didn't realize they did life sciences research. Uh, but they have uh, they, last October they announced a project called. The debug project, which has nothing to do with software. And they're going to release Wolbachia infected mosquitoes in Fresno, California, <laughs> which I was surprised to hear. I didn't know any of these were going on in California. Uh, but this, of course, uh, I mean, it's pitched in terms of uh, 
Aedes aegypti, and Zika virus. And the idea is, of course, that uh, we, as we discussed on a previous TWIV, uh, number 388, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, Bakia, when you put it into Aedes aegypti, aegypti mosquitoes, it uh, uh, inhibits Zika virus replication, as it does for other viruses as well. So the idea is to release uh, Wolbachia infected mosquitoes. Uh, in, you know, if you put a gene drive in them, they would drive through the population. And uh, that's what Verily is going to do. So I was surprised to see it. Right. So Verily is not doing a gene drive. Um, no. But what they're doing is these sterile mos- sterile male mosquitoes um, that have also been treated with Wolbachia. Right. So wait a minute. Um, uh, right. so, so when they mate with Wolbachia, females. Go ahead. Doesn't Wolbachia itself uh, 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 near sterilize the male? Yes. Right, so the Wolbachia right. ensures that when they mate, um, the eggs won't hatch. Right. Yeah, this is a so way of getting rid of mosquitoes in general. Yeah, so it, right. this is this is nippling sterile insect technique, um, slightly updated with 21st century technology, but it's the same concept. But more interesting is to release female Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes, which then are poor hosts for Zika virus and other viruses. But that's right. not what they're doing here. They just want to that's kill. Mos- they just want to kill mosquitoes. Right. As right. a matter of fact, if they released, if you were to, on top of this, release Wolbachia infected females, then you have both males and females Wolbachia infected, and now you'd no longer have the uh, sterilization no. uh, right. issue because no. it's only when a Wolbachia infected male. Uh, mates with an uninfected female that you get the eggs that don't have. That's right. Right. Anyway, happening near you in California. We'll see how that works out. I like the name of the project, Debug Fresno. It's good. They have a little van there. Partnership with Verily and Mosquito Mate. Wow, boy, who would have known that Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes would have ended up on the side of a panel truck? <laughs> And I would, th- I would think that although you might get, it'd be interesting to see what happens to this because I would think that although you might get a uh, a temporary impact on the population, that the uh, mosquitoes that are Wolbachia free uh, that ultimately come yeah. through this uh, will ultimately take over. Yeah, we did. This uh, is um, the problem. The problem in general with the sterile insect technique is that either you have to keep doing it forever, or you do it on a scale and in a location where you can use it as an eradication method. Right. Mm. So that was, that was used in eliminating screw worm from North America and was very effective. Uh, but they had to do it year on year until finally their, the fly was completely gone and then you can finally stop. I don't know. I mean, California obviously is still attached to the mainland, at least as of this recording time. Um, uh, ge- geographically anyway, geographically still attached to the mainland. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you're going to have constant influxes of new mosquitoes and, um, this is something that you'd have to keep doing, but it may be, it may be that they're just doing this as a pilot project to test the system and get everybody used to the idea and then maybe move on to something like a gene drive that could actually, um, maybe even do this without having to have annual retreatments. I think that we talked about the release in Australia of Wolbachia containing females, and they wanted to see how it would drive through the population. And, um, you know, they got, they got so much drive of the Wolbachia through the population, but it doesn't go forever. And then, you know, they're figuring out how to do that. But at some point, if you're successful, you could get it to be self-sustaining with Wolbachia, not killing off all the mosquitoes, but putting Wolbachia in them is probably enough because viruses will not replicate in the mosquitoes. So you don't have to really kill them all. <laughs> I heard on a pod, in fact, This Week in Tech did this story last Sunday. This Week in Tech was the inspiration for This Week in Virology. Leo Laporte is the host there. He called it Wabachia. <laughs> okay. You know, you got to go to your experts, Leo. And he wanted to know what's in it for Google. <laughs> One of his guests said, well, they'll get information, and that's what Google does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll be able to monetize the mosquitoes in particular. I'm sure. 
Our snippet comes to us via Steve, who writes, just came across this case of a virus infecting a fungus and enabling for now survival of European chestnut after the fungus made its way to the U.S. and wiped out most of the American chestnuts before finding its way to Europe and meeting the virus. If I've read it right, that is. Sounds very much a twib story. All the best, Steve, in Luton, England. Beautiful blue sky morning getting underway here. So this is an interesting story we've never done on TWIV. And um, one of the main workers in this area, Don Nuss, has worked on this story for years. I've asked him a few times to come on TWIV, and he doesn't want to. He's scared. (laughs) Imagine a virologist being scared. (laughs) I don't get it. Yeah, well, maybe I'll try again. But anyway, this is all about uh, chestnut blight, which is caused by a fungus called Cryphonectria parasitica. First reported in North America in 1903, in fact, at the Bronx Zoo here in New York, apparently was uh, introduced from Japan, this fungus, wiped out over the next 20, 30 years uh, most of the chestnut trees in the U.S. And chestnut trees, of course, are gorgeous, tall Wonderful trees that have populated many towns in the U.S. Four billion chestnut trees killed by this fungus. I don't think you find chestnut trees in many places anymore. There are few left here and there. No, and in fact, it's um, it's something you come across in historical records. Um, You know, people referring to forests of chestnut trees and. Uh, their old deed documents will say that the boundary ends at the chestnut tree on the corner, and it's all, you know, there there was just this was this was a feature of the landscape. They were the dominant hardwood species in the northeastern forests, um, yeah, yeah. and then they just are gone, and <laughs> they can't come back. It's spread by spores, airborne spores, and um, so it spreads very very quickly. And uh, it's made its way over to Europe as well. Now, what's interesting here for TWIV is that when this fungus is infected by a virus, it's called a, it's a, it's a double-stranded RNA virus. It's a mycovirus, a fungal virus. The virulence of the fungus is reduced, and so this virus is called C. parasitica hypovirus or CHV. And Dominus has worked a lot on this virus. Um, this is very interesting because there's no extracellular phase of this virus there. It's an intracellular virus genome, essentially, that's transmitted when fungal strains fuse with each other or sometimes by spores. So there are no virus particles. (laughs) It's just a viral double-stranded RNA. Hmm. And somehow it decreases the virulence of the fungus. How it does so is unknown. Don has, and many others have worked on this trying to characterize gene expression changes that it may correlate, but we don't have a mechanism. And I looked for a recent paper that might be fun to snippet, snippetize. Is that a verb, snippetize? No. Yeah, it is sure. now. Why not? <laughs> or you could just say snip. 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 And I didn't find one. So that hence this little summary, which I think is very... Now, what, what Steve sent us was a uh, link on a ProMed mail story uh, where the f- this fungus, Cryphonectria parasitica, was found in Bavaria on uh, on two trees growing in a forest. <laughs> so they were destroyed, and uh, no further uh, phytosanitary measures were taken. That's a new one for me, phytosanitary, for the presence of the fungus. And then they give a little background about the fungus and the virus that reduces its virulence. So people have tried using the virus. If you have an infected tree, you can put the virus on it. It does decrease the virulence. The problem is w- once you kill the fungus, it doesn't spread very well from one tree to another. So right. you have to in- put the virus on every tree individually. So they're still working on ways to, to try and use that as a control mechanism. It's a really interesting story, but uh, we don't know the mechanism. So, uh, sort of epidemiologically, is uh, is this is this virus having an effect? And if you, uh, my my sense was that uh, it it um, could in fact help the chestnuts come back, and that there was. A- I think it can help them come back if you if you have a chestnut tree that you pay attention to and want to maintain, like in a park or something. I don't think. This is something that you can scale so that it'll just take care of itself in the wild. Okay. 
According to ProMed Mail, it says, In continental Europe, the disease has lost its severity due to the natural spread of the hypovirus, which has enabled regrowth of chestnuts in many affected right. regions. Right, okay, so that's what I was thinking about, yes. From the right. ProMed. Hypovirulence provides the basis for disease management and research is in progress on virus diversity, dispersal, and establishment of hypovirulence. And I know people have tried to have tried a variety of approaches for bringing chestnuts back in the U.S. and um, nothing's, as I say, nothing's been able to quite scale to mm. uh, to the point where you just release it and then get your chestnut trees back. Of course, we've also cut down all our forests four or five times since they were here and uh, done all kinds of other things. So there, there are other issues. One cool thing about this ProMed mail is that, of course, it has lots and lots of links in it. Yeah. And if you check on the links of the pictures, there's some of the chestnut blight cankers, the growth of yeah. the parasitica right on the bark, and also the blight-affected chestnut forest, which is a black and white photo, which makes it even more stark to mm -hmm. show mm -hmm. how uh, the forest was destroyed by this. Well, Don Nuss, if you're listening, come on. If you know yeah. Don Nuss, if you know Don Nuss, tell him he must come on to Twiv to talk about this. I know Don Nuss. Don, come on Twiv and talk <laughs> about this. Really? All right. All right. Let's move on to a paper. There's a paper recently published in Cell Reports. It comes from uh, the Colorado State University, the Scripps Research Institute, U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases and the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Nathan Grubaugh is the first author. And then we have Falver, Ruckert, Weger, Lucarelli, Garcia, Luna, Murrieta, Gender Nalik, Smith, Brackney, and the senior author is Gregory Ebel. It's called Mosquitoes Transmit Unique West Nile Virus Population During Each feeding episode and this paper is open access is that what cell reports is, is that the yes report? i believe that sells open access um business right but uh but in any case this article certainly is it's a very cool uh, article that um is the, the idea here is to see how this uh west nile virus is evolving um we know that uh, in mosquitoes, the virus is quite diverse, but uh, overall, it, like many other arboviruses, it does not evolve very quickly, which is unusual for an RNA virus, and they'd like to get some insight onto why that is. And here, they are using a very cool system <laughs> where they can look at the virus in mosquito spit or expectorate, as they call it in this paper. They have... They give mosquitoes West Nile virus in blood. They give them a blood meal, and they've added West Nile virus to the blood. And then they put the mosquitoes in 50 ml conical tubes. and One uh, mosquito per tube. One mosquito they, per tube. They're put in solitary. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a membrane on the top of the tube. And on top of that, they put a little square of uh, filter paper soaked in sucrose, and the mosquito goes up to eat and uh, spits while it's eating. Because mosquitoes do mostly eat, uh, um, they're they're mostly vegetarian except when the females are going to yeah. lay eggs. Yeah, sap, right? So um, they they take the they put the mosquito in there for a while and it spits multiple times on this. Uh, it's just a nice image of mosquitoes spitting, but <laughs> they're just releasing saliva. And uh, then they can take this little square and do deep sequencing and find out. The, uh, all about the population of West Nile virus that the mosquito is spitting out. So it's pretty cool, and they can ask what does the population look like compared to what we put in and so forth. Now, traditionally, the reason why this is kind of a cool system is traditionally what you would do is you have a, a capillary tube, a glass capillary tube, and you would use that to sample uh, the, the mosquito saliva. It's, a, it's apparently an oil-filled capillary tube, and then you would kill the mosquito afterwards, and that's it. But here they're alive, and they can do other things with them as well. Yeah, you can, yeah. Get, cereal, you can get cereal samples. Yeah. That's the main thing. It, it didn't become clear to me the advantage of it till the very end of the paper. Right. Yeah. Uh, 
but the difference between the capillary and the filter paper was the filter paper allowed you to do multiple serial samples. I tried to look up the technique with the capillary because they say you you soak the mosquito's proboscis mm-hmm. in this uh, oil-filled capillary tube, and uh, implied in that to me was that the proboscis was moved removed from the mosquito, which mm-hmm. of course would take care of any future sampling. But yeah. the, they, uh, they, they would be also lost said, <laughs> they also said in the methods that, uh, like I couldn't, I couldn't find the detailed, uh, the, you know, a picture or a description of the detailed method, but they did say that sometimes in order to make this happen, they had to remove the legs from the mosquito. So, mm-hmm. uh, and they said, you know, this sort of, uh, uh, has an impact on the survival rate from the mosquitoes. So we needed a, uh, we needed a serial method. Unfortunately, and, unfortunately, animal use committees are usually pretty uh, liberal with what you can do to mosquitoes. Right. <laughs> um, I'm trying to find the extended methods. Um, I think that it's not a membrane on top of the orange top or the 50 mil tube. I think it's a, a very fine mesh, but okay. I could be wrong. Okay, a mesh is I fine. I blew, blew up the picture as far as I could. The mesh is fine. It doesn't really matter. It's just the it point blows. is they can go through it and get the sucrose yeah. from the filter, yeah. What blows my mind is that you can get deep sequence out of mosquito spit <laughs> on a filter paper. Give me yes. a break. So they have, uh, they quantify it, and there are, there's quite a few genome equivalents uh, in these, like 10,000 10, or so genome equivalents in the, in the spit that they collect. Now, it's multiple spittings, right? Because mm-hmm. they're in there for six hours, and so they say... And they have some evidence later that says there are multiple spittings in there as well. But still, it's, you know, it's about, right, about 10,000 or so. If those are uh, viruses, infectious viruses, we don't know. But it's quite a bit. So, yeah, that's okay for, for deep sequencing. And they use they used two different species of uh, West Nile mosquitoes, Culex quinquefasciatus and Culex tarsalis. So what they do is they take uh, both RNA from spit from both species, three individuals of each species. They call mosquitoes individuals. I really like that. They're they're well, they're they're individuals. They have their they own are. personalities, and as oh. we'll see, they have their own collections of West Nile viruses too. Um, and they take uh, samples at eight, fourteen, and eighteen days after blood feeding. So they've fed them blood. They put them in their little solitary tube, and then they uh, they're in there for six hours, and then they uh, take them out at those time points, and then they sequence. And the cool thing is that um, every mosquito is different from the other. The three mosquitoes are all different in terms of the virus population in them. And the, the three time points from each mosquito is are as different as uh, the, the, the different mosquitoes. This is in terms of the... Uh, the polymorphisms, the mutations that show up in the virus. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. So you start out with a certain population of viruses, and after 18 days in the mosquito, in terms of the genetic makeup, uh, that uh, th- those populations drift. And they drift in individual uh, mosquitoes, as Vincent said, as much as they do uh, comparing one mosquito to another. So it's pretty substantial. This, I was telling in the pre-show, Kathy, before you were on, I was telling Vincent, this is sort of the latter-day John Holland or John Holland on steroids, right? Because I'm, and I'm immediately, this is all about quasi-species, right? Mm-hmm. About the mutation rate in RNA viruses being relatively high and it not being a stable genetic population, but uh, one that uh, varies. And on an individual mosquito level, you can see this happen. They, mm-hmm. uh, they feed on uh, a certain genetic population, and that population changes over an 18-day period in the mosquito. So what they're going to deliver in a blood meal is different than what they started with. Mm-hmm. Right. And in fact, they also say that there's quite a bottleneck between what they put in and what is in the mosquito saliva eight days after blood feeding. So a very small proportion uh, of what's put in ends up there. So that's what a genetic bottleneck is when you start with a lot of variants, but only a few make it 
into the, in this case, mosquito, there's some kind of bottleneck that's restricting that. Which could be what? Uh, how different variants grow on different uh, cells in the mosquito or something like that? that well, I uh, think it could be things like that, but it, couldn't it also be that um, you're restricted by the volume that the mosquito can, can take up, right? Because you can't put a lot of virus in. And so that's in itself some kind of a bottleneck. Right. Even even in a viremic host, a few however many microliters the mosquito sucks up is not going to be very. Yeah. Uh, it's only going to be a sample. Yeah. Right. That's right. A small sample. Okay. Uh, they also and sh- as we'll we'll see in a moment, there may also be issues with the host. They also show that there are multiple populations in their individual samples, which they they think. Uh, is a is a consequence of multiple spitting episodes or multiple expectorated. They they say some mosquitoes expectorated multiple virus populations during the two days of access to the paper. So, yeah, that's when they limited them to six hours. Initially, they were taking they were saying you can you can have two days at this, and they found a certain level of complexity. And if they limited the exposure of a given piece of filter paper to the mosquitoes to six hours, the sample was less complex, indicating that over that two-day period of time, there were uh, multiple spits and maybe some evolution in the mosquito. Right. You know, while I was reading this, I could not uh, forget these signs where you see occasionally. I don't know if you see them anymore, but here in New York, there used to be signs say no spitting. And now your poor mosquitoes are restricted to six hours of spitting. Yeah, really. Now, they found four non-synonymous substitutions in the saliva from two or more individual mosquitoes. So non-synonymous means they lead to an amino acid change. Synonymous synonym would give it a, a, a nucleotide change that gives you the same amino acid. So these are four uh, amino acid changes at different positions. Uh, in the glycoprotein and the non-structural proteins of the virus. So they were curious about how they arose. Were they in the inoculum? Were they convergent evolution? And basically they conclude that um, they do find these changes, uh, three of them, in the input virus, but they think that's error because it's such a low rate in the initial, in the virus inoculum, they think it's an error property of the sequencing. So they think that um, these changes were convergent evolution. Uh, so it's very interesting. So in, in separate mosquitoes, apparently the same amino acid changes are being uh, selected, arising and being selected. They did go on to check these changes to see if uh, they had any effects on fitness, which was really nice. They engineered each one individually into an infectious clone, and then they did a competition experiment in um, in uh, mosquito cells in culture, and they could show that uh, the, one of these vi- mutants uh, had a competitive fitness advantage over the wild-type virus. And then they also infected mosquitoes and showed that two of the amino acid changes lead to uh, competitive fitness advantages over the, the wild-type. And the third, the, the uh, third one, or a third uh, change, uh, didn't have any advantage, and they say that might be a hitchhiker that just comes along with the other ones. That's the way to do the experiment, though. I was really impressed with this. If you're going to test for fitness, yeah, you nice. uh, actually do a competition experiment. Right. And I was impressed with the fact that they did it both in cell culture and in mosquitoes. Good for them. Yeah. I, I just can't fathom doing these experiments. It strikes me as so incredibly meticulous and so laborious. And yeah. a lot of sequencing. A lot of sequencing, yes. a lot of mosquitoes, one mosquito per tube. And now we're going to add a complication. We're going to add a, a bird that's going to be bitten by these mosquitoes. <laughs> so, Yeah, so the question is now you got this uh, changed population in the mosquito, and the observation is that in nature, uh, West Nile is relative to what they're seeing in the mosquitoes. Uh, genetically, uh, apparently, more stable than that. That's right. right? So, and that's, so how does that's that kind of surprising for an RNA virus? So, what's going on? Right. So they use young chickens, and they say 
uh, we w- we allowed mosquitoes capable of expectorating to feed on young chickens. So first, <laughs> they they had their mosquitoes in a in in individual mosquitoes in tubes, and they had been given a blood meal, and they made sure they had to pick the ones that could expectorate viral RNA. So apparently, not all mosquitoes are either going to pick it up or expectorate it. I guess so. They find okay, these mosquitoes have expectorated RNA, so they had to sequence the filter while the mosquito's sitting there waiting. And then the ones that could expectorate RNA, they dusted them with fluorescent powder. Yes. <laughs> I have a picture of it, which is so There's cool. a picture of this <laughs> couple of pink mosquitoes and the other mis- brown mosquitoes. And then they say they transferred them to cartons with 8 to 10 unexposed mosquitoes to facilitate blood feeding. And they say cartons, it just... You know, I love the word carton. It's just this, there's such high tech in this paper, and here we are in a carton. <laughs> so I I didn't quite understand what they meant by that. Facilitate why would that how, how why would it facilitate it? And by unexposed, they mean unexposed to the virus, right? Yeah, not yeah. just not unexposed. Yeah, to, or to the virus, to the That's virus right. powder. I I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, we I need Dixon here. We need we need Dixon here for that one. It's all. I get the impression that there's. Uh, almost as if there's some sort of social component to um, uh, getting yeah. uh, among mosquitoes for taking a blood. Yeah. Hey, look that that mosquito's biting. Let's go. Yeah, go for Maybe. it. So, uh, and then they um, they so they let these mosquitoes feed, so they know which ones are infected because they're fluorescent. And then after they feed, they take them and see what's in them, and then they see what's in the chicken. Right? Do I have that right? They, yep. they get the mosquito right after feeding and see what it's it's spitting out, and then they look right. at the serum of the chicken one to four days post-infection. And in this particular case, that's curtains for that mosquito. So they take the whole mosquito. That's right. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. So they so they feed they feed virus in the blood meal with a group of mosquitoes, and your pink mosquitoes are the ones that you're that you know you can get virus out of. Yeah. And then you let your pink mosquitoes feed on the chick. And you wait for the bird for a few days, and then you take bird serum, and you're going to compare your ground-up mosquito with your bird serum. Right. You right. And the- you can take the bird serum serially as well, up to four yes. daily for up to four days after uh, infection, I guess you'd call it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And you also take that mosquito after it's bitten, and you, you, you sack it, basically, and get what's right. in its salivary gland or saliva, right? So you're close to what was delivered to the chick. Yeah, so you're you going can... to look at something close to the input virus, and you're going to look at what happens in the right. chick. So then you sequence both, and what they find, which is really cool, is that the diversity goes away in the chick. So genetic distance between the viruses in the saliva rapidly decreased. Most of the variants are gone in <laughs> by selection in the birds. And in the birds, the mutation frequency is is very, very low. There's very little diversity. Uh, in the birds, which is really incredible. So you you go from mosquito where you have each mosquito is different. Boom! In the bird, all the the minor differences are gone, and they quantify that um, in terms of how many of the synonymous changes are gone. Half of the variants um, are conserved. Ten um, percent of the non-synonymous variants conserved, and. Uh, as time goes on, pure, this is called purifying selection, where you're getting rid of the diversity uh, in birds. So basically, um, they don't seem to have a bottleneck going from mosquito to the birds, and that in the bird selection purifies the population so that it all looks pretty much similar and very different from what the mosquitoes delivered. So chicks dig genetic stability. Chicks dig genetic <laughs> stability. There's got to be a title somewhere here. <laughs> So, uh, I get kind of confused with some of the terminology here. Mm -hmm. So the difference, for example, between a bottleneck and purifying selection. So bottleneck would be if you, if you have a diverse population and only a few get in, that would be a bottleneck, but, uh, purifying would be. There's no bottleneck. A lot of the viruses get in, but then over time they're purified so that the, vi- okay. the diversity is gone. So if you look at day one in the chick, you can see that most of the vi- the mosquito viruses got in. But by day four, all the variants are gone. So there's okay, no bottleneck. So, so um, 
the effect of the two is similar in yes. terms uh, in in that the genetic diversity may be decreased. But I would imagine that uh, now is a bottleneck uh, uh, at all specific, so that only certain types of uh, guys get through. Um, it's because in a purifying selection, you're going to select for certain genotypes. Right. Mm-hmm. My that's, my that's understanding the, of a my understanding of a bottleneck is that it's a random event. Okay. Mm-hmm. I may be using that term incorrectly, but my my sense of it is that it's it's usually used to mean something that just picks three out of the ten thousand or whatever, and those those go through. Um, whereas a selection is some actual there's a benefit to having this particular sequence rather than that particular sequence mm-hmm. okay i think that's fair yeah and i'm we will well, undoubtedly hear from evolutionary biologists if we're not correct about that but it's fine we would love to hear from them yeah they've been rather quiet lately <laughs> yeah all right then the last experiment is they they tried to do uh, multiple transmission cycles so you know you have a mosquito bite a chick and then mosquito bite the chick again and go to another chick and so forth and see how the virus is uh, evolution evolving during this. Uh, the problem that they found though is that the mosquitoes with high enough virus in them to transmit it uh, died before they could transmit it. So the like only the ones with less than 10 to the fourth genome equivalents per expectorated saliva sample survived and these weren't able to transmit uh, very uh, very effectively. And that's interesting. I didn't realize that mosquitoes died from this. Right. So this is a problem for their experiment because um, <laughs> they couldn't do it the way they wanted to. Uh, so what did they do? Only West Nile populations from serum were analyzed through multiple transmission cycles. Anyway, basically, um, only a small proportion of the mutations that accumulated were non-synonymous. It's, it's it's essentially the same conclusion that even if you can go from chick to chick, um, you see very few mutations um, and very even fewer non-synonymous ones. In other one, in other words, ones that would lead to amino acid changes. So that's the bottom line here. New, an interesting way to collect uh, serial samples of saliva from mosquitoes. You find every mosquito that takes a a West Nile meal has a different collection of viruses in the uh, salivary glands. Uh, And then once those viruses are injected into a young chick, uh, the differences disappear. And the overall effect then would be the observed maintenance of a certain, uh, of an apparently lower genetic diversity than you might expect based on an RNA. Yeah. But it would also mean that if conditions change, maybe a new bird species gets infected or local conditions are different, the virus has this step in its life cycle in the vector phase where it generates an extreme amount of genetic diversity that can then be reselected in the next host. Yeah. Interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. They, they discuss how in the mosquito what's going on in the process of taking up the blood meal and the virus making its way to the salivary gland and and multiplying and being stored. And then there are lots of opportunities for uh, drift, genetic drift to occur. And they they say, you know, when the saliva is expectorated, the entire process then goes on with a new set of viruses coming out of the salivary gland. So it's really a dynamic situation. They do mention, though, that there's a caveat with using young chickens, which are probably immuno, uh, immature to a certain extent. And they say, we should really do this with some other birds. Right. <laughs> yeah. and they they also, they have some other things to say about that. that they say, some other experiments that they did, that what they say, uh, suggest that it is a valid model, but nevertheless, you ought to do it with some other birds. Uh, by the way, I looked up, I just looked up bottleneck, which I should have done before. And it basically verifies what, you guys were saying, and that is that it's a uh, non-selective, really, or a random uh, crash of a population. Uh, that okay. Has the effect of decreasing the diversity because you're just taking a sample of what was yeah. a diverse population. 
um, but it's not it's not uh, in itself selective. Now they have a nice discussion on um, the balance between uh, selection and drift, and I'll see if I can get this right because I think it's it's uh, it's informative. Now, so basically, they found three amino acid changes in the saliva of multiple mosquitoes. They decided this was not part of the input virus, so they say this is probably convergent evolution. And uh, they say these were probably positively selected in the mosquito, um, but they did become extinct in some other mosquitoes. So they weren't in every mosquito, and in the fitness assays, some of them became extinct as well. And they say this is probably in part due to the fact that there are bottlenecks in the mosquito, which would eliminate uh, some of these changes. But they also talk about uh, the fact that the selection for any change has to be large for that change to become dominant in a population. Because there's always a balance between whether a mutation is selected for or it's extinguished in a population. And that also, that depends in part on population size. And they say that these data highlight the interplay between selection and drift within mosquitoes and demonstrate why arbovirus mutations with large enough selection to displace the ancestral phenotype are rare. So you don't see that often. For, but for, in their two examples they cite, which are examples of mutations that have become dominant, it's very rare. One of them is the mutation in chikungunya that allowed it to multiply better uh, in um, 80s albopictus, and that allowed it to spread globally. And the other is in uh, West Nile, uh, where um, a mutation arose during spread of the virus throughout the U.S. So mutations can arise, but unless they have a, a strong selection coefficient, which is this little s, has to be very large for any mutation to be dominant. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, it, it is, uh, you can see that in their work here. In, in terms of no mutations becoming dominant. So I, I like that discussion. I thought that was good. The other sort of uh, sideshow from this is that they investigate a little bit further to verify it is the notion that mosquitoes that get a large dose of virus in a blood meal uh, become sick and often die. Yeah, right. right. So uh, that th my understanding is that that's a new observation. And to me, that plays in hugely to the whole uh, dynamics of this arbovirus replication. Yeah, yes, yeah, for sure. And it would it would select for uh, viremia, but not too much viremia. Right. Yeah. So you're not going to have a lot of transmission if you want the mosquito to survive, right? Right. And they they also say that impact that it also impacts on the spread of mutations. It's probably also why they're low because you're not getting right. a bigger dose. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. They did cite that uh, at least uh, mortality had been reduced. That ha observation had been made previously in mosquitoes, okay. but maybe not, or excuse me, morbidity, but not mortality. Okay. Um, others have reported the lifespan was decreased. Well, which you could take either way, morbidity right. and mortality. Yeah, the, the disability adjusted life minutes for the mosquito, I guess. <laughs> So it's a self-balancing system. You have huge diversity in the mosquito, but then it's it's kept at a low level to keep the mosquito alive. And then once it's delivered, the virus is delivered to an avian host, all the del deleterious mutations are removed. And so the system has evolved that way. Otherwise, it wouldn't be around, right? It wouldn't have been sustained. Right. Well, this is what's this is what's always bothered me about the whole quasi-species thing to start with. Okay is uh, you have these uh, relatively error-prone replication mechanisms that generate uh, this uh, significant diversity. How do you maintain anything like a stable population? And This is uh, one uh, fairly sophisticated uh, example involving, uh, you know, two hosts yeah, right. uh, to show how, that, uh, show how that might happen. Very interesting. So, so you can maintain some sort of genetic stability. Nevertheless, the whole quasi-species thing, as Alan was saying, uh, provides the potential in the long run to adapt to uh, changes in the environment pretty quickly. Yeah, it'd be interesting to look at a single-host infection, 
see what goes on as virus goes from host to host, right? Right. Because uh, here it, you can imagine why the the, gen, the genotypes of the virus are different in one versus another. But what if it's in a single host? Do you now have influences on host genotype, where it's the, all humans or all rabbits or, or whatever? Is there an influence of genotype and not species on the um, genetic diversity of the virus? That would be cool to look at. Also, are there any good mammalian models for West Nile virus? I know it's primarily an avian virus, but... Well, they they do use mice. Um, yeah, they're mouse models, yeah. I don't know what you mean by good. Right. I'm, I'm just wondering um, what kind of variation you see if you take the mosquito pool and it goes into a mammal instead of a bird. Do you see the same, the same uh, virus selected out, or does it vary between mm-hmm. mammals and birds? Mm. I'll bet you it's different. Yeah. I'm not sure it's been done, um, but now that we have this precedent in this paper, it could be, right? You could right. do substitute chick for with mice uh, in this mm-hmm. story, right? You could do that. Anyway, cool paper. Yeah. Uh, learn a lot about evolution. It's open access, so you can check it out. But, of course, you're listening to TWIV because you're working or exercising, <laughs> so you can't Doing read the paper. Essays. So right. Can, so what's interesting, what, the, reason, the reason we're into this paper um, is uh, that it's, it's showing a different evolutionary, um, a, a kind of a different evolutionary process going on in two different hosts for the same virus. So you've got a mosquito host that allows a, a significant amount of mutation to occur in the virus and that even over time, the virus that's in that you sample from that mosquito changes substantially but then when it goes into the avian host um, suddenly it it gets restricted and selected for a much uh, much more clearly defined population of virus and that's just cool all right let us move on to email we have an email from average jane who writes, Dear TWIV scientists, professors and science communicators, you are, I suspect, the sort of experts to address a question like this. Let's say you're an average Jane, average education, who lives in a world of fake news. You want to use critical thinking, especially on issues of science that directly affect you and your family. What steps can you take to think critically when you see opposing views like the example below. It could be any example. I just chose this for illustration. And uh, Average Jane includes links to two articles. The first, Do We Dare to Eat Lectins? uh, from the Huffington Post. And a YouTube video from Dr. Gundry, Lectins are the root cause of inflammation and disease. (laughs) Best regards, Average Jane. And we have several different ways of uh, addressing this. I will let Rich, you can talk about your approach, which I think is really good. You know, I I immediately went to PubMed and started looking for articles about lectins and inflammation. And I found, for example, an article, uh, I think it's a review article, lectins, agglutinins, and their roles in autoimmune reactivities. And you could read this, but again, if you are not scientifically inclined, it might be, Difficult for you. Um, and just to make it clear, all you have to do is Google PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, and that takes you to the site, and then you can type in some keywords, and it'll pull up the abstract. So even if it's an article that isn't open access, you can at least look at the abstract. And I think most of us would do something like that when they wanted to address a scientific issue. We'd go to PubMed, and we'd find articles and start reading them. But not everyone can do that. So and, and in we'll, fact... I would just want to point out, I don't know if this is because I modified my browser or if it's built in, but if you go in, for example, Firefox in the search menu and you click on a little magnifying glass, it gives you options. You don't have to search Google. You can search Yahoo or Bing or Amazon or something else or PubMed Mm. is one of the options that I think is built in. But anyway. So Rich, you had a nice uh, idea here. Well, I I want to comment uh, to start off with that um, the very fact 
that Jane is asking the question is critical thinking. The fact that she looks at these two sources and sees a discrepancy and wonders which one is correct and has doubts in her mind, all you have to do is just keep doing that until you come to some satisfactory conclusion for yourself. Uh, and, you know, that's critical thinking. Um, and I have to say that, <laughs> so I did that myself and I do this all the time. This is what you do. You, you know, you just uh, do your own research, explore around, be a skeptic, ask questions, don't believe anything, make up your, you know, uh, draw your own conclusion. And, you know, with this guy, is it Grundy? Gundry. 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 Uh, it becomes obvious pretty quick. Uh, and uh, one of the things, you know, I'm kind of going around uh, corners here, but one of the things that I found in the in the process of my own search is this site called the Skeptical Cardiologist. Because this guy, Gundry, uh, was a cardiologist uh, and so shows up on this. And uh, on this Skeptical Cardiologist link, uh, he has a, a little poster that he calls the Red Flags of Quackery, uh, which is really good. Uh, all of the different uh, things that are signs that somebody is a quack. Testimonials, quotes like, helps your body. Is it a celebrity doctor? Is it based on ancient wisdom? Blah, blah, blah. It goes, uh, goes on. And this guy, Gundry, fills uh, many of those, uh, or uh, waves many of those red flags, not the least of which is that he's selling something. Yes. And you go to his site, and uh, not only will he tell you um, that lectins are bad for you, but he's got <clears throat> dozens of products <clears throat> that you can buy and books that you can read <clears throat> to uh, help you avoid this lectin catastrophe. And I have to say that after doing this for a while, I found that uh, all of my searches are now infected with Gundry. <laughs> because, of course, all the advertising thinks that I'm interested in Gundry, and he pops up on my browser all the time, and I'm sick of it. Um, there's another thing that came up. I think, Kathy, you came up with this. A, uh, a, a wonderful course, a curriculum by a guy named Douglas Duncan at the mm -hmm. University of Colorado. Did you find this, Kathy? Teaching yeah, the nature yeah. of science using pseudoscience. Right. I can't remember what it was in connection with, but yeah. I, I think I did. it may have been a twib pick or something like that. And this well, guy has, yeah. he, he has a, he has a, uh, a course on teaching the nature of science, uh, using pseudoscience. So it's by contrast, but I would say it's also a course in critical thinking. Uh, and it's all, it's a whole course on how to distinguish between real science and fake science. Um, and so I'll provide that link and you can just look through the whole thing. It's, it's, I, it's actually quite interesting. I love it. I think that it's, it's a lot. It's a lot there. It's a whole course, but yeah, just Very going good. through will really help. It yes. teaches critical thinking. And the last thing I found was this cartoon in the course of my efforts from, I love this cartoon strip, Non Sequitur, <laughs> yes. uh, about the pass-fail critical thinking test where this guy's walking down a sidewalk and he sees a sign that says bear right. And if you go right, you see that there's a big grizzly bear hanging by a street post waiting for you to come by. What I like, uh, one of the things I liked about this uh, course is a quote, science is not the only way of knowing religion and philosophy are others, but it is a specific way of knowing if something does not follow science procedure, it is not science. Science is a uniquely powerful way of trying not to fool yourself or be fooled by others. I thought that was a really good definition. And he has lots of examples that you can do. One of them is um, a, a thing here. Which car do you think is the safest? You know, they have three different brands of cars, a Camry and an SUV and a big pickup truck. And then the next slide, he shows you the uh, the numbers and of course, the Camry is the safest in terms of fewest people killed. I'm not sure that everyone would say. You look at the big 
pickup, or and you'd probably say that was safer. And I just wondered, probably the people who buy Camrys are just safer drivers than people who buy Ford F-150s, right? That could be. <laughs> part of the process of science. Well, it turns out the Ford F-150 is, is uh, the reason it's the top selling truck is that uh, it's the standard for fleet vehicles. Mm-hmm. So if you're buying 300 of them for your public works department, um, so that that's a vehicle that's often being put into riskier situations than the family Toyota Camry. So that's a valid point. Mm. Mm. But I want to I want to circle back to what I said initially, and that is that I think that uh, if you're even noticing that there's a difference and questioning which yeah, is correct, you're yep. already doing the critical. We're thinking. participating. Yeah this this whole discussion is is that right. And so trust yourself, you know, trust yourself and just keep doing the investigations. And the wonderful thing about, I mean, the internet is both good and bad, but I think that if it's used correctly and you're capable of using it correctly, it's mostly good. You can track all this stuff down and make your own, uh, make your own, come to your own, uh, conclusion. And I would say that based on the fact that you're asking the question in the first place, you're going to come to the appropriate conclusion. And lectins are fine. Lectins are fine. Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Johannes writes, Dear Professor Racaniello, dear hosts of TWIV, I am a regular, re- I'm a relative regular listener and enjoy your discussions. May it be on virology or more general science-related topics, even the political ones. Doing my PhD in molecular toxicology, I enjoy following you to broaden my scientific horizon. Viruses are to me just complex nanoparticles naturally occurring and sometimes of the kind that make you sick. In episode 449, The Sound of Non-Silencing, you discuss the problem of predatory journals. Going through the literature my BSc intern used, I recognize that educating young scientists is an important thing to fight predatory journals. I spend quite quite a lot of time myself tracking down some of the cited literature of which I didn't know the publisher. While doing that, I realized it is not easy for a scientist in training to differentiate an open source journal propagating open access for the sake of society from a predatory journal. What I found on my search and what I would like to share with you is a neat website. And this is thinkchecksubmit.org. It's a website providing a process called Think, Check, Submit, basically a checklist containing useful tips and tricks helping to identify predatory journals. Since you're all experienced members of the scientific community, I would like to hear your opinion on this website and also how to educate scientists in training to watch out for predatory journals. I assume we as a scientific community will never be capable of fully preventing this parasitic form of publishing, but it is our duty to give the predatory journals a hard time to be successful. Best regards, Johannes. P.S. Please revive urban agriculture. I enjoyed it a lot. Hmm. And thanks. Check, submit. I had not seen this. But I had a look. I had a look at it, and uh, you know, it's perfectly reasonable. Uh, the think part is simply don't just blindly jump into this. Check is where the meat of this is, and it has a uh, basically a checklist that you should go through uh, to help yourself decide whether or not a given journal is uh, predatory or not. And then, if it passes that checklist, sure, go ahead. Some of the examples are. Do you or your colleagues know the journal? Can you easily identify and contact the publisher? Is the journal clear about the type of peer review it uses? Are articles indexed in the services that you use? Is it clear that what fees will be charged? Do you recognize the editorial board? Is the publisher a member of a recognized industry initiative? And that's the list with uh, with details going along with it. And I would say that if you were to go through that exercise, and I think one of the most important things is the first, do you or your colleagues know the journal? Colleagues right. is important. Check with other people. And the editorial um, board, the important sub point is, uh, there is do the editorial board members mention the journal on their own websites? Right. So are people proud to be associated with this journal? Mm. That it's uh, there is a caution here because you know really predatory journals can have people listed on their editorial boards who are not editors who they just exactly. picked out of the blue. Okay. If you click on the about link, it tells you that this has been produced with the support of a coalition from scholarly communications in response to discussions about deceptive publishing, and it lists those organizations. Oh, good. Some of which I recognize. 
Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, is another good critical thinking tool. How how transparent is a source about its uh, about its origins? Yeah. And here they're not selling anything, which is good. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Kathy, can you take the next one? Yes, it is from Steve. Right. He just sends a link. <laughs> well, there's a little thing below. He's got more oh, below. Oh, oh, that, okay, got it. Okay. As an environmentalist, conservationist, and lifetime science enthusiast, I find I am all too often faced with impossible choices like the one presented by this position. For most of my friends, it is an easy choice. More and more research is showing that even creatures once thought to be non-sentient are showing surprising empathy and care for one another. Monkeys are right at the top of the almost human scale. Experimenting on them is torture without any doubt. I certainly could not do it, even for mice. I noted that even Vincent seemed to balk on realizing recently that a mouse had been pinned down alive for four days while a cell of its leg was observed under a microscope. Uh, Question, do I sign or not? So this... I am having a hard time looking at what the link itself is. The link is uh, uh, to an org. You got it? Yeah, it's a change.org link to a petition about uh, a monkey project on uh, to do infectious disease research. And you can uh, choose to sign or not sign the petition. So... That's so what, there's apparently a, a, a breeding colony mm-hmm. of uh, monkeys uh, in a, is it the Salt River yeah, I Prima think so. Maricopa Indian community? Yeah. Yeah. And the uh, apparently the uh, offspring in this breeding colony are being sold and used uh, for experiments. I mean, this At happens. CDC. CDC, right. Yeah, this happens. And somebody has... Uh, take an exception to this and uh, wants to and is circulating a petition online to uh, keep this from happening. Of course, the photo they include is very um, emotional because it shows a young primate who is not happy with uh, being picked up. Um, However, we do talk about non-human primate work a lot here on TWIV, right, for various viruses and um, I think you have to decide whether uh, you you want that to go forward or not. Um, you know, I I, wa- I note that work on chimps has been discontinued in the U.S. right because of these considerations. Um, but these other uh, non-human primates can still be used. So, uh, my first inclination is: How do we know that everything they're stating in the position in the petition? Is true, and if you go down below, there is an update. Uh, they are not being sent to the Center for Disease Control. Run on sentence. They are being funded by them and the National Institutes of Health. The experiments are being operated by the University of Washington. They're taking place at either the facility or second location. So, um, thinking back to the question about critical thinking, that that was sort of my first inclination. Right. Right. Uh, it's, how do we know that what they're saying in this petition is all true? It may well be, but I don't have a way to vet that. Right. You'd have to you'd have to dig into this, um, do a bunch of googling to find the facility and the. I, I mean that that would all be um, under U.S. law. That is very tightly regulated. There will be an IACUC, an Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee supervising these experiments and so forth. And um, all that stuff does have to be documented. And many of those, a great deal of that documentation is public. So it is it is searchable and one could dig into, I, I didn't dig into it either, but you know, if, if you were seriously considering of signing this petition, I would recommend doing so uh, and finding out what the deal is. But I would also note that shutting down one facility of, of this type, even if the petition succeeds and it's not clear that it has any legal standing to do so, wouldn't stop people from doing non-human primate research. So if that's the crux of the objection, then I don't know what you're hoping to accomplish here. Yeah, there's no doubt that non-human primates are being bred somewhere in the U.S. and being used on 
in infectious yes. diseases experiments. Whether or not this is the case here, we don't know. And I don't know, as you said, whether signing this would have any effect anyway. And if you did, if this facility shut down, then the the monkeys for the experiments would have to come from someplace else, which they would. Yeah. So the the central objection, as I understand this petition, is about the use of non-human primates in research. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the real beef that I see here, and um, you know, I think it bears noting that nobody is nobody likes doing experiments on animals researchers who do this do it because there's no other way to get the answers to the questions that they're working on and if there's a better model then we'd use a better model you know we'd we would love to be able to control things more rigorously than you can with particularly with a monkey experiment because there's not even good uh, uh good genetics you can do with them like mice but um we do need this research and um you know, it's it's often for viruses and and other and other pathogens that we are very rightly and and extremely concerned about. Um, so, you know, this is the deal. Yeah, the mouse, right. even mice. Um, you know, I I've done a lot of mouse experiments, as have uh, others here, and yeah. uh, I'm not happy about it. And especially this experiment that he's referring to, it was in a TWIP paper we did. They kept a mouse immobilized for four days. I thought that was a bit much, but they needed to do that, right? So you do what you're comfortable with, um, but uh, you have to do some extent of animal work to, to understand infectious diseases. And, and part of the uh, cook review process is, can you do this any other way? What's the value of the science? Yes. Does it justify the amount of discomfort you're putting this animal through? And are, And if all of that if the answers to all of that indicate that you should proceed, then the question is, how do you minimize the discomfort to the animal? So these are all concerns that are taken very, very seriously. All right, uh, let's take one more. Rich? Okay. Anthony writes, Retraction Watch. Uh, this is a quote from Retraction Watch, I guess. Rigor Mortis, which is a book begins with the story of the 2012 Nature paper by C. Glenn Begley and Lee Ellis that is now famous for sounding the alarm about reproducibility in basic cancer research. But as you document, this is not a problem that began in 2012. When did scientists first start realizing uh, there was a problem? And I guess this actually comes from uh, an interview with the author of this book, uh, and um, Anthony says, I've just started to read this with great interest. The book does have what might be considered an unflattering comment concerning Stuart Firestein, <laughs> for what it's worth. <laughs> so, so, what's the uh, question? When did we f first worry about reproducibility, meaning like fraud in science? Is that? Uh, yeah, well, or actually, the, cent the central article is one of these. There was a gaggle of these around 2012. Uh, where uh, people did the sort of a retrospective meta-analysis uh, of a lot of uh, cancer drug trials or, oh, yes. right, uh, right, right. Uh, and came to the conclusion that not, not just drug trials, but also, uh, you know, what causes cancer, what doesn't, that kind of stuff, uh, and came to the conclusion mm. that a very large fraction of them were uh, at best flawed, if not dead wrong. Okay. And so, so there've been a flurry of such papers and, and this results in the general conclusion that, you know, science is all wrong and you can't trust it. <laughs> you, you may remember we did a paper a while ago by John Ioannidis, who is also, he, he, I think it was entitled most, uh, scientific research is wrong. And he, mm -hmm. he happens to be a professor at Stanford. <laughs> was talking with Harry Greenberg about him. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. And he's another one who has, another individual who has really pushed this idea forward that, uh, you know, science is all, is all wrong. Um, I don't know when this started. My, I, it was first brought to my attention when we did the Ioannidis paper, which was not too long ago, but obviously it, it goes older than that. 
if you go to this, I had a very quick look at this. Uh, yes, this is an, an interview with the author of this book uh, on Retraction Watch. Uh, and if you go to this, uh, I believe the answer the, to the question is that uh, this sort of uh, thing goes back to ancient times, questioning whether, you know, the science is right. Sure. I don't, but questioning is part of the science. It's, no, it's nothing new. All right. It's we all question, new. and that's that's how it goes forward. But to publish things that say science is all wrong is wrong itself because I think so. Not wrong because what happens is two two labs try and do the same thing and they get different results because that's the way variability works. It's not because it's wrong basically, and these well, these individuals are ignoring that. And I, I think it's also important to point out that this is very field and subfield specific. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of the stuff, there was, a, there was a big hullabaloo about reproducibility in, um, psychological and sociological studies. Mm -hmm. And then I think that was, that predated this, um, discussion in the 2012 nature paper, which was about, um, cancer studies, especially clinical studies. Mm -hmm. And the problem with those is that they are often, they're very hard to fund. They're very hard to set up. They're usually run by companies who have a vested interest in the outcome. And you get results and, you know, the negative results get buried. The positive results may be the result of, of kind of hacking around the statistics until you got the answer you wanted. Um so, yes, there there are reproducibility problems, especially in some areas of science, and that is something that deserves attention. But to leap to the conclusion that, therefore, all the science is, is BS, that's too extreme. I agree. And a lot of, uh, to, to me, a lot of this stuff is um, uh, you're dealing with looking for very, very small effects on a large heterogeneous population under circumstances yes. where there's going to be at least some publication bias. Uh, and so that's, you know, it's a touchy situation. And you do have to be careful about that. But I agree wholeheartedly that the, you know, blowing that up into the uh, all, you know, most published science is wrong is just not, not accurate. I can say for a fact that the, the mutants that Rich Condit published years ago have been studied recently by others, and it's right what he published. <laughs> well, that's good to know. <laughs> uh, I can also say that I have published some stuff that's wrong. I won't detail it. <laughs> <laughs> it's of no no big consequence. You know, we all you know you make mistakes, mm -hmm. or of course. you just make mistakes. You know, things change, and you have new new insights into uh, what uh, what was going on. Right. It turns out that wasn't the way to design that experiment because yeah. of factors that you didn't know about at the time. Right. Right. But that's that is uh, what's being discussed. And and it is I, I think there's a legitimate gripe here, especially when we're talking about things like clinical trials. Mm -hmm. um, these are huge sums of money and people's lives and they're being used to um, uh, to justify clinical decisions that will affect even more people's lives. Uh, so yeah, we should we should worry that those are not maybe up to the standard that we thought they were, and we should look at them very skeptically. Um, but that doesn't mean we should stop doing them, and it doesn't mean that everything that's been done up till now was wrong. It just means we need to continue to look skeptically at how those trials are set up, and maybe even reevaluate the way some of those trials are set up. But remember, many drugs save many lives, many vaccines. Most vaccines are great. They work. They're all products of research. The way of things course. work and gene expression, development, you know, wonderful things like CRISPR, they're all, they're right. <laughs> yeah. It's not all wrong. So yeah, there's a, tr there's a <laughs> tremendous amount that's right, and that's how we got here. Yeah. By the way, for those who are uh, interested in pursuing a given thing further, one of the resources that I have wound up turning to frequently when there's some study that's in doubt is the uh, Cochrane collaboration, which is a group of uh, scientists that are in the business of doing meta-analysis of uh, published uh, studies. So they will, on a given topic, uh, collect all of the information they can and make their own 
uh, evaluations of which studies qualify as legitimate and which don't, and then try and assemble those and come to some sort of conclusions. Uh, I'm not saying they're always right, but it's an interesting resource. All right, let's wrap it up with some picks of the week. Alan Dove, what do you have for us? I have um, a full, a fun NASA video. I love it when NASA comes out with a, another neat video, which they do pretty often. This one is taking images that they that they shot with the Pluto flyby, which you may remember from what about six months ago, um, and they put them together into a video that is a flyover of Pluto. And right, um, so right toward the beginning of it, you see, I believe that's Earth, or, or no, that's the Sun in the distance, wow, coming up over the. You know, that's that's sunrise on Pluto. Well, you're not going to the beach on Pluto. No, you are not going to be getting much of a tan on Pluto. And then it then it follows around across the surface of this. Um, I still think of it as a planet that uh, uh, that it is surprisingly contoured. Um, and it, it's just a really cool view of something that uh, that I don't think any of us will ever be visiting. <laughs> So are these so those the are, movies? Are they, go ahead. Go ahead. Are these movies or assembly of, of photos? It's an assembly of. Um, uh, I think it's an assembly of photos. Okay. Because they don't have. Yeah, it's definitely an assembly of photos. Um, so they don't have the bandwidth to send a video back, mm -hmm. and it wouldn't have. You know, you wouldn't be able to have this long a uh, good shot. Got it. So this is um, this is from all the data that they got back, and then they were able to put together this pretty simulated smooth. Some, pretty smooth. So yep. they got some really serious uh, craters yep. on this yes. planet. So is this are all planet? of those impact? Uh, I'm <laughs> I hereby it will declare always be it's a, a planet, planet to me. <laughs> yeah, I grew up with it as a planet. I'm not giving it. I'm wondering if these are all impact craters, or some of them look volcanic. Yes, this uh, one of the. One of the areas is called Thulu Macula. A little, yes. little call out to H.P. Lovecraft there, right? Yes. Cool. Cool. It's very nice. Thank okay. you. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, so I have math limericks. I, um, <laughs> uh, I ran across a couple of math limericks on Facebook. And then, of course, being a critical thinker, I tried to find out the source of these because I didn't want to just, you know, do a random Facebook page. And I think basically the source uh, is to some extent lost in antiquity, but I did find uh, a, a website that I found and posted on several websites. I did find a website that I really liked that I decided to use uh, as a source for this called the Futility Closet, which is sort of a pick in itself. The Futility Closet, I think, is the most eclectic website I've ever found. They, uh, uh, this guy was a, uh, an editor for, um, science or technical journals for his career. And I guess he's retired now and did this just for kicks. Uh, he and his wife are mostly interested in obscure little historical tidbits and they have a podcast that does one of these, but they have all sorts of other random stuff on this site. Uh, the most, uh, the most sciencey stuff is math oriented. And, uh, so this link is to, uh, as part of their site, that's math limericks. And there are several of them, but the ones that caught my attention are two are about midway down here that are two huge equations. Mm -hmm. And I'll just do, I'll just do one of them that I really like. <laughs> uh, actually both of them are good, but, um, uh, the equation is 12 plus 144 plus 20 plus the cube root of 4, all of that over 7, plus, in parentheses, 5 times 11 equals 9 squared plus 0. <laughs> and you can look at the equation. And the limerick is a dozen, a gross, and a score plus 3 times the square root of 4 Divided by 7 plus 5 times 11 is 900 squared and not a bit more. 9 squared and not a bit more. That's great. Right. Mm -hmm. 
and there's another one. I won't give you the equation, but the integral z squared dz from 1 to cube root of 3 times the cosine of 3 pi over 9 equals log of the cube root of e. <laughs> These are great. I love them. Yeah. So there you go. And there's several other limericks. They're good. Oh, actually, I got to read this one. This is good. What is this? <laughs> I'm looking uh, there's a there's a number here one two yeah that's number great. yes one two six four eight five three nine seven point two five two seven five eight four six three points is out this is a limerick one thousand two hundred and sixty four million eight hundred and fifty three thousand nine hundred and seventy one point two Two seven five eight four six three, unbelievable. <laughs> there you go. I, have, I have to read the last one because it relates to a Christmas present I got from my older brother. <laughs> a mathematician called Klein thought the Moebius strip was divine. He said, "If you glue the edges of two, you get a nice bottle like mine." <laughs> and so, uh, my younger brother and I each got Klein bottles from uh, Bill for Christmas. Klein nice. bottles. Cool. Yeah. Huh. Well, actually, Jeff up. got a Klein mug. It's a, it's a, yeah. Anyway, Klein. And just try and drink the coffee out of that. Yeah, <laughs> this is great. I love it. Very good, Kathy. What do you have? I've picked something. Uh, I picked two things. I had these in my picks uh, several weeks ago, and then something more timely came up that I uh, displaced these with, and so I pasted the nim- them in without even looking at Alan's pick. Mm-hmm. My first pick is approaching Jupiter, and so it's a, a, a NASA uh, image that was actually picked as the astronomy picture of the day on May 23rd. And so it's uh, photographs uh, aligned and digitally merged into the time-lapse video that's pretty cool. And then the second thing... And these, these were actually shot by amateur astronomers from Earth. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Which is very cool. Yeah. And the There's second one is, is, uh, is a video about vaccination. And, you know, here on TWIV, we're preaching to the choir, but it's several parents from Michigan talking about examples of what happened when they didn't vaccinate their kid. And that's going to relate uh, in a way to an, another pick coming up. So just two kind of classic with picks and unfortunately the, unfortunately the second one is on youtube and they left comments on yeah but so uh, the related video ignore the related videos in the right hand column and ignore the comments just right. yeah the video is good yeah mm-hmm. it's great uh, my pick is an article from ars technica it's about the nominee for the uh, head of the usda and uh, our president has nominated a talk show host, Sam Clovis, who has no scientific background. And he has called climate research junk science. Um, he said, I have looked at the science. I have enough of a science background to know when I am being boofed. And uh, it's been checked that he never had a single undergraduate level course in any science. So I don't know what he's talking about. And so this is very concerning, of course, because although uh, not all of USDA is about science, they do have a 1,000 permanent scientists and 100 research facilities, and you would think that uh, a director with some science background would be appropriate to head it. Well, and this guy, he's he's not going to be heading Department of Ag. He's going to be the undersecretary for research, education, and economics. Sorry, yes. So this he will be the chief scientist for USDA. Correct. Duh. And has no not only has no science background but actively denies data. Mhm. Yep. Now his, another stellar pick from this administration. His nomination will require Senate approval. So, They'll rubber uh, stamp it. Um why do you say that? Cuz they do everything. That's that's what the party in no. power does these days. Well, I'm not sure. I think uh, we should make our our desires known to have a scientist in this position and not a talk show yep. host. I mean, this is so obviously wrong that <laughs> my my senators my senators know how I feel and and seem to agree. So, 
Yes. But yes, people who, who are in states where their senators might actually go along with this nonsense should once again go to the phone and the email and pester them about it. There was just a, um, a campaign about uh, net neutrality in the uh, federal FCC, Federal Communications yes. Commission. And there was quite a response from the public about that. Uh, something like over 10 million people responded that they would like to maintain net neutrality. I'm not sure that will do anything, but um, I think that's encouraging that enough people are willing to speak up about something that maybe is not as clear. I don't know. It seems a little esoteric, but... It's yeah. not that hard to explain. Yeah. Um, you know, do you want your cable company to determine what, what, what websites you have access to is what it boils down to. And um, yeah. people think that they, that shouldn't be the case and the net should be neutral. All right. We have two listener picks. First one is from Neil. He sends a link to a video on Dig. Uh, these smart girls are here to debunk anti-vaxxer nonsense. A cute little... Uh, Video put together by an academy, the Nueva Schools Science Rap Academy. And it's a totally great parody from Hamilton. It's just right on. Is that right? Yeah, oh, says, yeah. I haven't seen yeah. it, so I don't know. But oh, yeah, I, yeah. I haven't seen it either, but I have the soundtrack. I don't have uh, it. I highly either. recommend getting the soundtrack. But yeah, it's, yeah. Cool. And uh, the little girl has a great voice, by the way. Mm -hmm. really like her voice. I'll do, yeah. She's the best. And then we have from John. Hi, Vincent, Dixon, Alan, Rich, and Kathy. I offer a listener pick of John Seaver's Reddit. Ask me anything about the Rotary Club and polio eradication. It's John, from John in Limerick. And he, John Seaver's vice chair of Rotary's Polio Plus program. He's to, he's cool. uh, answering questions here on a uh, AMA that, that took place uh, in the past, of course. But it's a nice discussion. About and you, even the guinea worm comes up here. All right, so thanks for that. And that, so a cool thing is that he puts the little yin yang single. I yeah. can't talk. Yin yang, yin yeah. Yang symbol after all of our names, making us equal uh, recipients of the uh. email. Yeah, we have Ascaris <laughs> after our name. <laughs> this is John who thought we had said Ascaris and not Asterisk. And I'll do it for Twiv451. You can find it at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash twiv. And the program that you use to listen to twiv on your mobile device, there are many different ones. You can subscribe to twiv in that. So please subscribe. I'm always puzzled that some months we have billions and billions of downloads and other months we just have millions and millions. And I wonder why we don't always have billions and billions because if you subscribe, they should automatically be downloaded. So please do that. It really helps us to secure more advertising to have more downloads. So please do that and send us your question and comments to twiv at microbe.tv and consider supporting us. If you like what we do, go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a Patreon account where you could give a dollar a month and we have other ways you can support us as well. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. Rich Condit, emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently vacationing in uh, Oregon at a place called Sun River. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Always a good time. Always a good time. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. You can also find him on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.com. W.S. The introductory music on TWIV is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.